Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to discuss We by Evgeny Zamyatin. It's a really interesting book. It's an early example of dystopian fiction. And it's a book that, to a certain degree, sets the template for what we think of as a number of the uh, archetypes of dystopian fiction. Uh, Zamyatin was writing in the immediate aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution and the Russian Civil War as the uh, realities of the new totalitarian state uh, that he was living in became uh, much more clear. And that is very present in this book. It's set in the future, but it's set in a future of one state where uh, everything is under this governmental control. Now, what's interesting is that this is not a sprawling one state. Rather, it seems to be restricted to like one large city. And there's a wall around the city and there, there's this sense of terror around whatever absolute disaster is occurring outside of that wall, but within the wall is, is absolute control. And we get a window into the society, but it occurs through an interesting um, perspective. What makes Zamyatin's we unique, um, not only that he was living in a totalitarian state and, and writing this dystopian novel about that type of life, but it's from a first person perspective. And I think that's a unique flavor to dystopian fiction. A lot of times it's from this third person perspective where we get this world building exposition, but here we really just have this secretive journal that our narrator is writing. And he doesn't really have a name, he has a number and a letter. And so record two, it's spring from beyond the green wall, from the wild plains out of sight in the distance. The wind is carrying the honeyed yellow pollen of some flower. This sweet pollen dries the lips. You keep running your tongue over them. And every woman you meet, and every man too, of course, must have these sweet lips. This somewhat interferes with logical thought. And then what a sky, blue, unsullied by a single cloud. What primitive taste the ancients must have had if their poets were inspired by those absurd, untidy clumps of mist, idiotically jostling one another about. I love, and I am sure that I am right in saying we love, only such a sky as this one today, sterile, an immaculate. <laughs> and so we start out with our narrator giving us this we, uh, that, that there, there's not a sense of I. Uh, his own thoughts, he feels his own thoughts really are the same thoughts that everyone else has. And he questions his thoughts that he has as he starts to realize that they may be unique, that he may have his own unique personality and his own unique uh, volition that he wants to, to value. Um, but he is part of the integral, and he's, he's, he's a, an engineer, he's a mathematician, and, uh, and so we get that side of it as well. And that's an interesting component. There are, there are ways in which Zamyatin plays on certain uh, references in Russian literature where there's the uh, famous moment Dostoevsky refers to, what if two plus two could equal five? And he has a whole uh, multiple paragraphs within a chapter where our narrator is saying like, what's so beautiful about the multiplication table is it's never wrong. And the path of two, you know, two plus or two times two is always going to give you four. Um, and I think it's a very clear reference uh, to the you know strange ways Dostoevsky was trying to to pin the individual soul and consciousness down uh, that Zamyatin's playing at. But it's eerie how a man who is living in the immediate aftermath of the revolution and the civil war and and the emergence of this totalitarian state, when we really consider that. The Tsarist Russia was an autocratic state as well. It was totalitarian in, in a different perspective. Uh, Zamyatin is, is fueling all of that uh, into this narrative, and it's, it really feels that way. There are multiple references to this idea that the new future society um, that he is revealing to be dystopic is uh, atheistic, is you know super uh, advanced, that everyone is really... Uh, the same, that there is this collective, and it seems to be this um, <clears throat> ideal, sarcastically ideal, ironically ideal version of a um, communist totalitarian state. Uh, but underneath all of it, there are elements where I think Zamyatin really was inspired by living in Tsarist Russia for much of his life as well. But then our narrator begins to experience this strange woman who wants to meet with him. People are able to, everything's controlled as it is in many dystopic totalitarian novels. Um, <clears throat> even romantic attachment, which is not romantic, it's simply physical attachment to say this physical desire, uh, it is controlled by tickets and you get a ticket for who you're going to spend uh, this 45 minutes with. And it's all timed and you can, it's the one time you can like shut the uh, curtains 
on your window so nobody can see in to see what you're doing. <laughs> they can see you the rest of the time though. Uh, non-stop surveillance feels like another theme of dystopic fiction. And he suddenly, instead of the person he usually has been exchanging tickets with, it's this other woman. And he starts to unravel that he is, as, as a member of this integral, which seems to be an, er, uh, an early version of like a spaceship that's going to launch off to other planets and, you know, take one state there as well, uh, that he is integral to their revolution, where they're going to instead take the revolution, not just in the city, because it seems to be this like wild, you know, jungle beyond that, that green wall, uh, not just within their city, but out to other planets he's gonna go take that you know he's gonna be part of this revolution on Mars which is kind of exciting and it, it lends this uh, strange science fiction element to what seems to be uh, dystopian fiction on the whole but as that happens there's a really interesting way in which he starts to Zomitin's narrator starts to discover uh, what he fears may be a soul so from record 20 discharge is the most suitable definition that's what that was I now see like an electrical discharge these last few days, my pulse has been getting drier and drier, quicker and quicker, more and more tense. The pulls closer and closer, making this dry cracking sound. One millimeter more and there'll be an explosion, after which silence. Inside me right now, it's very quiet and empty. The same as in the building when everyone's left and you're lying all alone, sick, and you can hear this clear, precise, metallic beating of your thoughts. Maybe this discharge cured me finally of that torment called my soul, and I'm just like all the rest of us again. Now at least I don't feel any pain when I see O in my thoughts standing on the steps of the cube, when I see her under the gas bell. And if she gives them my name there in operation, so be it. My last act will be to put a pious and grateful kiss on the benefactor's punishing hand. In my relationship with one state, I have that right to undergo punishment, and this right I will not give up. <laughs> it's just really quite awful. Um, and so there's a Kafkaesque sense to the, to the uh, sense of punishment the sense of fear and dread that just hovers over the narrative that we get in we. Um, but it's very effective. It, it, that, that first person sense in the dystopian narrative really gives a different feel um, to the you know more omniscient third person sense we so often get. Uh, there, there's a, a different sense of urgency, a different sense of anxiety, I guess, uh, that seems to be in there. And it almost feels as if Zomitin writing this from an eye perspective, if he's caught writing it, what type of trouble would he get in, just as our narrator would get in trouble if his, you know, secret journal uh, expressing these, these individual ideas, this, this concept of a soul that he fears he has, uh, how, how, what trouble would he get in? And, and then there is a revolution. <clears throat> and uh, that, of course, is, is, is fascinating because at this moment there was this, in, in world history, there was this sense that perhaps the Russian Revolution would lead to revolutions in Germany, uh, in Asia, in other, in, in other countries, other continents, um, and then it, it would really spread and be, be a global uh, phenomenon. And Zamitin is kind of pushing at this idea that the, um, the narrator starts to realize, wait a second, as soon as they, they think they've got this revolution and that they've perfected it, then there can be no more revolutions, but the whole concept is that you're always going to evolve and change and grow and progress, and that will lead to the turning over of you know what was once the new perfect system. And he he really does question the the whole you know philosophical and logical underpinnings of one state. Uh, so it's a it's a really interesting book to read. It, it's certainly very uh, enjoyable for anybody who enjoys dystopian fiction, but I also think it provides a really interesting window into that um, into that consciousness uh, that, that existed in in the Soviet Union in Tsarist Russia um, but even in that uh, sort of post-World War One uh, milieu and one of the things that's of course super fascinating about the book is that it was to a large extent suppressed it, it needed to be published in other languages um, and it wasn't for some time before it could be published in uh, <laughs> its Zomitin's nation of origin so it certainly was effective in terms of asking questions. So it's, it's a book that I uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, getting back into. It had been a long time. This translation from Clarence Brown was uh, quite, quite good. And as I think about um, Zamutin and We, there are, of course, books that come to mind. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The stories and novellas of Andrei Platonov, of course, feel super relevant, particularly Soul. <laughs> Um, but also, I think a, a 
not true contemporary of Zombie Tim, but somebody who was certainly following along um, in sort of the generation after would be Victor Serge, who is uh, one of the most, uh, one of the better like writers, more literary writers of that first generation in the Russian, um, in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. And so his Unforgiving Years um, is a book I'm certainly very interested in jumping into, having read numerous other writings from him, including his notebooks, uh, which were more private and again sort of written from a personal perspective, not memoirs that he expected to be published as memoirs of a revolutionary art. And of course, it's hard to think about uh, books being suppressed <laughs> in the Soviet Union uh, without thinking about The Great Master Margarita by uh, Bulgakov, um, which I read earlier this year. I had mentioned, of course, there's a sense that um, feels very comparable to what Kafka was doing in stories like um, In the Penal Colony, even before the law, um, and some of the other uh, almost parable type stories that Kafka was interested in sharing. Brave New World feels um, deeply inspired by uh, we, though I think that 1984 is more, ha has more obvious connections. There are, there are certain aspects of 1984 um, the, within we, the ancient house, um, the idea of, <coughs> excuse me, um, a romantic relationship sort of being part of what, what sparks this sense of self and individuality. Um, the, the two, I think that the two sort of totalitarian states of 1984 and, and we are more comparable, the idea of Big Brother and the, the lack of privacy that exists in we. I think 1984 is more obviously inspired by we, uh, though I think Cuxley well, it was familiar with it when he wrote Brave New World. But I'm also really interested in reading um, Karen Boy's Collocane, which comes in between Brave New World and 1984, and I'm hoping to get to that this month. And it would, <laughs> another one I hope to get to probably next year would be Amit Hamid uh, Tanpinar's Time Regulation Institute, which from its description feels a, a little bit more on the like Terry Gilliam Brazil side uh, than on the like 1984 side. but another way of exploring dystopia as a form of bureaucracy, I would say. And then closing out, um, Philip K. Dick, of course, is, is very interested in dystopian ideals, though his feel uh, a little more modern, probably. The Last Election by Pete Davies takes the ideas of totalitarianism, of surveillance, and puts it in what I think at the time felt like a very contemporary setting. It doesn't feel like a dystopia that's super far distant, but rather a dystopia that's kind of around the corner. Um, and then at that sort of a contemporary short novel would be um, Castle uh, Griffin by Kurt Tucholsky, um, which again, I'm looking forward to jumping into as well soon. And then finally, uh, Zamitin, it's, uh, often I think we just think of him as the writer of We, but he did write other works. Uh, one of his stronger stories, The Cave, is in the uh, Viking Portables um, 20th century Russian reader, which I highly recommend. That was also translated by Clarence Brown. And um, Platonov is represented in here, as are some other uh, fiction writers um, from that early uh, Soviet Union era. So let me know if you've read We. Let me know what your thoughts are on it. I had read it in late November for New Worlds November and then just utterly lost my voice. And so I'm just getting back to trying to share some of these books that I've really enjoyed reading. But uh, this was this was an interesting one to dip back into. And the way that Zamutin likes to explore mathematics is an interesting component as well. Uh, that, as a math teacher, I appreciate it. So I hope everybody's having a great week. Thanks.